is it possible to completely eradicate fear from your human nervous system? Not to cover it up and not to ignore it, but to be free of it completely. And if so, what would that change about our world? Well, we'll come back to that. Right now, I want to look at a very arcane and mystical word. A word that seems to cause as much confusion as it does clarity. From what I have seen personally, the word gnosis seems to have roughly three definitions. The first and most common is very easy to swallow. It means growth through direct experience as opposed to being taught something. An example might be experiencing five spatial dimensions while on a DMT enhanced state. You can describe it with words to give an idea or you can work up mathematical equations to prove its existence. But until you have inhaled three lungfuls, you will not have a so-called Gnostic understanding of these five spatial dimensions any more than a person can describe what Ted Drews tastes like to somebody who thinks that McDonald's serves ice cream. It's got any freeze in it. This is the reason that an apprenticeship of any trade is preferable to sitting in a class. A classroom will get you a nice little vocabulary and maybe even help you know what you're talking about. But until your hands are dirty and your mind is scattered from being out in the field, you will never truly understand the concept being taught. The second definition seems to be oceans apart from the first. It points to the Gnostic Gospels. These are the highly debated lost books of the Bible, some of which, like the Apocrypha of John, were found years after the Bible was formed, and some that, like the Book of Enoch, were removed by the Vatican for reasons unknown. But don't tie yourself up too much with particulars yet, considering that these lines are blurred across the board when considering the origins and authors of these missing books of the Bible. It seems as if some of them might have been removed on purpose for sinister reasons, reasons that we will go into later. The third definition is where it starts to get a little weird, but at the same time hit home in a very strange way. There is an ancient philosophy that lines up with many other worldly myths throughout time that parallel the idea that physical matter, being our world, was birthed from a less than perfect sentience that created our universe in an attempt to chase its own ignorant desires. The first gulp of this philosophy seems dreadful, but reaching the bottom of the cup, there is certainly a beacon of hope. Hope. Despite these three definitions being differentiated, they are still represented by the same word. Is this a coincidence? Is this laziness on the part of human language? Or is there a direct correspondence connecting the origins of this word and its philosophies? What do we know about fear and its effect on the nervous system and spirit, as opposed to its counterpart, love, which also is a widely used word with multiple definitions? Just like the myriad of mythologies and religions all over the world throughout time, these mysterious words can be traced back to a singularity of information. Information that, despite being abstract, can be grasped by the human mind, or more appropriately, the loss of it. So, if the word Gnosis had a mascot, it would certainly be Abraxas. Abraxas holds a shield to protect him from ignorance, but I like to think of this protecting him from temptation. Uh, the head of Abraxas, being that of a rooster, is a metaphor of vigil awareness. But again, I like to look at it as symbolizing the act of waking people up, like cock-a-doodle-doo, mother um, good morning. I wanted to get those first two out of the way to illustrate the point of symbolic communication in the first place. People will jump at the opportunity to tell you what a symbol means specifically. If that is how symbology works, then you might as well just make a language for it and line it out carefully in Webster's Dictionary. But we know that symbols don't read out like that. The deepest meaning of this communication is personal to you. You are the one deciphering it because after all, you are the one responsible for applying this knowledge to your specific life and personal individuation process. If we want something to have an objective meaning, then we can just make limitations through definitions all day. But Abraxas here is subjective to you, while at the same time pointing us all in a similar direction. I mean, you can lead a horse to water. Look at that horse.
The legs of Abraxas are serpents. As we've seen on a few episodes thus far, serpents are very cunning and clever. They can find their way in and out of any place or time with little effort. Abraxas keeps control of his chariot by shepherding the horses with his whip. The chariot, like in Hindu mythology, symbolizes the body, and the horses symbolize one's own will and desire. The whip, of course, being a metaphor of the control Abraxas has over this earthly vehicle. And you'll notice that the reins of the horses are oftentimes depicted being held by the mouth of the serpents. This is uh, very interesting. So very much like our first definition of the word gnosis, Abraxas certainly does seem to represent the subjective personal human experience. He is either you or the personification of someone or something that you might encounter. Either way, it captures the essence of how one carries themselves in the face of adversity. The early Christians that we call now call the Gnostics believed that despite errors in our world, the way of improvement is through the insight of human consciousness. They maintain that the true divine first cause of the world, or God, so to speak, can be experienced through the spirit, bypassing the flaw of the craftsmen responsible for it. This means to overcome the many debacles of everyday life, which is inherently built into our world, and apparently by no accident, as we'll see here soon. In his book, Wisdom of the Knowing Ones, Boop. Manly P. Hall wrote, Death releases the divine spark from its lowly prison, but such release may only be temporary unless liberating knowledge has come to the human while still on earth. It seems the Gnostics hinted that we live within a physical prison, but the Zen masters might say that they left out the fact that we are holding the key. And well, the door is not even locked, but instead just lightly guarded by some tomfoolery of the etheric realms. What could it be that the bars of this metaphorical prison are made of? And what if these so-called bars are something that we just came up with to limit ourselves? Like we do with insurance companies, for example. It has been debated in the church for millennia whether or not evil exists. The argument, of course, being that evil is just the absence of God. But this is weird considering that a God would be omnipresent in all things. So really Really, just like any other, the word evil is just a mouth noise that we use to point in a particular direction. And well, it's a fantastic word with strength behind it. Calling an insurance company bad doesn't quite cut it. Considering that it is illegal not to have insurance, yet the insurance companies are part of the few that create that very law. They make it illegal for you not to pay them your hard-earned money. Yet when it comes time to provide a service for us, they simply don't have to. They simply change the law to make it so that they don't. This is, by definition, evil. I would like to break down the Apocrypha of John in this video, as I think there are quite a few parallels to today's understandings of quantum physics and the messy nature of reality. And leave the Gospel of Thomas alone for now, because I have that one planned for a future video in comparison to uh, the Tao of Physics. But for a moment, let's just talk a bit about the Gospel of Mary, which by loose definition, not a Gnostic Gospel, as it, it wasn't found in Nag Hammadi with the others, but it's definitely worth mentioning here. First of all, there is no evidence in the Gnostic Gospels or in the main canonical Bible that Mary Magdalene was a prostitute. That accusation just never existed until Pope Gregory in the 6th century insisted upon it as head of the Catholic Church. Ah, oh, f***ing Greg. The Catholic Church in general is guilty of not only the thing that you're thinking of right now, but also of changing the Bible at their will in the same way that the insurance companies change the law. They have done it in order to maintain and provide sustenance to their own power. They seem to feed on the faithful in the most sinister way possible. This is an archetype for archons if I've ever heard it. But this calling Mary a prostitute was intended to objectify women as submissive to men and well leave it to some old pale angry unlaid dudes with shriveled up 
wants to just take all the juice out of the most sacred of teachings. Back in the day, however, women were considered to be highly mystical and even psychic. They were known to have intuition very superior to that of men. I don't mean this in a pandering way. Women were considered to be different than men, for sure. Not equal, but superior in particular portions of the right brain intellect. So it is no surprise that when Jesus told the disciples to go forward and spread the gospel, or good news, so to speak, the disciples exploded in fear, thinking that they would also be tortured in front of a live audience like their main man did. All of them except for Mary Magdalene, who understood soundly that this physical body was not only temporary, but entirely not real whatsoever, lining up quite strikingly with the rest of the message in the Gnostic Gospels. It is said within the text that Jesus seemed to find Mary to understand the gnosis of his teaching above all. When asked about this, Jesus responded likewise with a parable. He said, when a blind man and one when a blind man and one who sees are together in darkness, they are no different from one another. When the light comes, then he who sees will see the light, and he who is blind will remain in darkness. And I mean, damn, what a one-liner. Old JC was straight spitting. Son, when angels would appear to mortals in the Bible, it was very common for them to exclaim, be not afraid, because their very presence alone would make a motherfucker just pass out or go insane like some Lovecraft shit. This has caused an entire drift of memes online named after biblically accurate angels, which of course differ greatly from how they were personified in medieval art, like as, as babies and shit with wings. They didn't look like that. That makes it very interesting interesting considering Mary Magdalene was actually able to handle the visions given to her unwaveringly. Now it shouldn't, but it kind of reminds me of Betty and Barney Hill struggling with what was happening to them. Betty was aloof, kind of walking around the ship getting a tour and you know, the famous star map was shown to her. That is just, well, I'm not going to say it's funny, but it's... Uh, it's funny. Speaking of the Vatican making changes to the Bible, which is strictly forbidden according to uh, the Bible, it actually seems as if there was also never a hell. There were certainly consequences to a person's spirit depending on how they lived their human life in a myriad of different ways, but the whole eternal pit of hellfire thing, uh, well, it, it was just never there. And to be honest, it wouldn't make much sense anyway. This is just something that those who see themselves in control have made up in order to maintain their own systems of control. And then there is the absolutely bizarre codex that we call the Apocrypha of John. Upon first appearance, this jazzed up little piece seems to have aliens and demigods and hybrids, wild ass hallucinations. But when you reread the text, depending on how you are culturally programmed, it seems to point in a couple very auspicious directions. When I first read the Apocrypha of John years ago, it was from a biblical point of view. The second goal around I saw it in a mythological light. Being a fan of Joseph Campbell, this definitely brought me closer to the text, but it's still nothing quite worth reporting on to you. After going through quite a few books by Fritjof Capra, who wrote The Tao of Physics, well, a third time's a charm, because it caused me to see the Apocrypha in a much brighter light. So uh, by now we understand that symbols and allegory are useful in many ways, especially to illustrate something ancient that there weren't technical and scientific terms yet to do so. When reading the Apocrypha now, it seems as if particular terms like monad could mean primordial sentience. Pleroma could equal to the unified field. The Sophia seems to indicate the imagination part of our psyche and its bunk ass creation, the Demiurgo seems to represent physicality or uh, particles. The term that goes by the name exalted seems to represent our DNA, and the spirit of the four lights seem to represent the strong and weak forces of nature. The term Yaldabaoth seems to represent the formation of psychological ego. Now, before we actually go into the text, I need to lay down this little disclaimer. This
This channel of ours is all about speculation, the what ifs. If you would like to be educated about the Apocrypha, I recommend you check out Esoterica with Dr. Justin Sledge. Uh, that's not an endorsement, by the way, as well as the Peaceful Savage Show. And by all means, get yourself a copy of the transcript for yourself. But I would like to explore the nooks and crannies of my own mind on our YouTube channel here and with a humbling yet inspired love for these sacred teachings, try to connect the cryptic depths of this doctrine to a more modern understanding. So John encounters a being that seems to change form at will as three separate archetypes yet as one. This is, is wild right off the bat. The heavens opened and I saw creation which is below heaven shone. The world was shaken. I was afraid and I saw in the light a youth who stood by me. While I looked at him, he became like an old man and he changed his likeness again, becoming like a servant. There was not a plurality before me, but a likeness with multiple forms in the light. The likeness appeared through each other. The likeness had three forms. John asked the being to know or understand who or what it was, and it responded. The monad is a monarchy with nothing above it, as in corruption, which is in the pure light, which no eye can look. Uh, then it is speculated, since everything exists in him, for it is he who establishes himself. He does not need anything. He is illimitable, since there is no one prior to him to set limits. He is unsearchable, since there exists no prior to him to examine him. He is neither large nor is he small. There is no way to say what is his quantity. His essence does not partake in the eons nor in time. It is he who puts his desire in his water light, which is in the spring of the pure light water which surrounds him. This is the first thought, his image. She became the womb of everything, the mother father. The thrice male, the thrice powerful, the thrice named androgynous one. This is strikingly parallel to how our friend Lao Tzu describes the Tao. That seems to indicate heavily upon sets of three. As it goes into that womb of everything spiel, this apparently feminine being began to ask the primordial first cause for indestructibility, eternal life, and to be granted with truth, all of which were granted to her. This seems to me like an illustration of conscious free will being born of the unified field long before humans ever carried that divine spark. But I suppose it could also be seen as a splitting of genders as the prior being was in fact androgynous. It requested to give it a fellow worker, which is the mind. Mind came forth and it attended Christ, glorifying him and all these came into being in silence. I noticed the end of that passage, all these things came into being in silence when referring to a fellow worker, which was the mind. This lack of sound seems to be parallel to the absence of the word, or om, as called in the East. Then it mentions a mighty voice and insists that the truth of this voice will penetrate only those worthy. This mighty voice is a language and seems to permeate all living things. And if you remember our video entitled Modern Mystics, we discussed how the language of DNA speaks to only those those who are worthy, but I'll read parts of it here. Honored with a mighty voice, virginal spirit placed the divine truth over everything. Autogenes? The truth which is in him. He may know the all which had been called with a name exalted above every name, for that name will be mentioned to those who are worthy of it. I'm gonna cast it pretty far out there on speculation, but we are always talking about the number 12 throughout these scriptures, you know, 12 and 60s uh, in Sumerian. It is almost as common as the number three. What is interesting is that in the next part, we speak of four lights and three times four equals 12. It also mentions the Christ. And if we look at that, like the Christos, as in the cerebral spinal fluid of the, the Kundalini, it makes me wonder if the 12 quoted here might refer to the 12 ventures of the brain. We know that the Egyptians often depicted the bodily anatomy as personification. I don't see it as crazy to at least wonder if this is any different, but I'll, I'll read it and, and you decide. Understanding grace, perception, prudence, these are the four lights which attend the divine autogen, uh, auto, autogenies. It's, auto, it's autogenies, isn't it? 
These are the 12 aeons which attend the Son of the Mighty One, the Christ through the will and the gift of the invisible spirit. And the 12 aeons belong to the son of the autogenes, called Pagera Adamus. Pigeon Adam? Now, this next part is where things begin to take on shenanigans. When the Sophia begins to get ideas for herself and decides to, well, create something new without the consent of the first one and only. The Sophia, being an Aeon, conceived a thought from herself. She wanted to bring forth a likeness out of herself without the consent of the spirit, without his consideration. Yet she brought forth. And because of the invincible power which is in her, her thought did not remain idle. Something came out of her which was imperfect and different from her appearance, because she had created it without her consort. For it has another form. When she saw the consequences of her desire, it changed into the form of a lion-faced serpent. She cast it away from her outside that place that no one of the immortal ones might see it, for she had created it in ignorance. She surrounded it with a luminous cloud, and she placed a throne in the middle of the cloud that no one might see it except the Holy Spirit. She called his name Yaltaboth. Yaltaboth, Yaltaboth. This is the first Archon who took a great power from his mother. He removed himself from her and moved away from the places in which he was born. He became strong and created for himself other Aeons with a flame of luminous fire which still exists now. And he joined with his arrogance which is in him and begot authorities for himself. This of course we know is the birth of the Demiurgos, the flawed reality. This seems like mind moving without spirit. I noticed that she places a throne in the middle of the cloud of her creation. So despite being ashamed of it, there is some kind of pedestal there. Especially when you, you consider that she hid the beast in a luminous cloud as opposed to a dark cloud. And last I checked, light attracted attention more than darkness does. The Archon who is weak has three names. He is impious in his ignorance, which is in him. For he said, I am God, and there is no other god beside me, for he is ignorant of his strength and the place in which he had come. Uh, this reminds me a lot of the first three commandments given to Moses on Mount Sinai, you know, after he inhaled that acacia smoke, if you know what I'm saying. But uh, it is interesting that before anything in the commandments about murder, thievery, or in your neighbor's wife are mentioned, the first three commandments, much like the first two rules of Fight Club, are pretty much the same. But in this case, just clarifying that he is the only God, and he gets pissed when anyone thinks otherwise. And just like the early Christian Gnostics, I have to also agree and speculate, uh, why would a one and only God have any reason to clarify that he is? Down to its core, it's, it's just not sensible. Unless these first three commandments were added by men later, which according to Occam's razor is most likely the case, but uh, whoever spoke these words to Moses was not representing old big guns upstairs. Basically, if there are no other gods, what is there to be jealous of? Yaltaboth had a multitude of faces so that he could put a face before all of them according to his desire. When he was in the midst of the seraphs, he shared his fire with them before he became lord over them. Because of the power of the glory he possessed of his mother's light, he called himself God, and he did not obey the place from which he came. Okay, I mean, this is the archetype of the persona and ego complex all day. Go get Carl if you don't want to take my word for it. This next section seems to illustrate the first movement of atomic structures and the pulsing duality that we see not only between wave format and quantum entanglement, but also vibration vibration of material physical matter at the subatomic level. Then the mother began to move to and fro. She became aware of the deficiency when the brightness of her light diminished. She became dark because her consort had not agreed with her. John asked,
asked, uh, Lord, what does it mean that she moved to and fro? He smiled and said, do not think it is as Moses said above the waters. When she had seen the theft which her son had committed, she repented. She was overcome by forgetfulness in the darkness of ignorance, and she began to be ashamed. She did not dare return, but she was moving about, and that moving is going to and fro. Twist seems like. According to mythology and religions all over the world, light is always synonymous with the divine and darkness is always synonymous with physical matter, the lower gross realms. But it also kind of reminds me of a, of a crazy woman in a padded room rocking back and forth. So I, uh, I don't know. She repented with much weeping and the whole Pleroma heard the prayer of her repentance. They praised her on behalf of the invisible virginal spirit. He consented and when the invisible spirit had consented the Holy Spirit poured over her from their whole Pleroma. It was not her consort who came to her, but he came to her through the Pleroma in order that he might correct her deficiency. She was taken up to her own eon above her son that she might correct her deficiency. It's like it's up to us. The Pleroma, being the unified field to modern science, was the medium in which repentance could be heard. She was not punished, but forgiven and put on a pedestal so that she might fix this f up. But her son being strong and ignorant, if physical form that is, is already off and running. And well, here we are. Despite being born into that huge syntax error that is her son, the Demiurgos, it seems as if it is now up to us to realize the imperfections of that syntax error in which we were born into and embrace the great spirit that penetrates all things, including this f up part of the hood, you know, that bad neighborhood up there in heaven. I mean, there is a black dot in the white part of the, the yin yang after all. I think that hypothesis can be slightly backed up by this next passage that I'll, I'll summarize here. A voice came forth from the exalted eon heaven. The man exists and the son of man, the chief archon Yoldabaoth heard it. All right, listen here, you sexy ass librarians. Uh, it's me. I'm editing this video right now and I'm realizing that it goes on for another uh, 35 minutes. I suppose there's just no way to break down the Apocrypha of John in uh, <laughs> that amount of time. So I'm going to have to make the rest of this a part two where we will finish the Apocrypha of John and its breakdown, as well as look at the science of the effect of fear on the nervous system and how we can practically actually go about bypassing that, therefore transcending the entire trap of the Black Cube and the Feasting of the Archons themselves. I know I usually slap these bitches with a dramatic ending at the end with a little twist and everything. That's going to be coming up uh, next week, and I'll call it Gnostic Lore Part 2 so you can recognize it. Nevertheless, though, thank you so much for the views and the shares and, and the love, and I'll see you guys here here in the chat in a moment and can't wait to see you for part two of this. Thanks.